Netflix is ruining K-dramas. This is a hot take that is popular among international K-drama viewers. At the core of this discourse is the concern that a genre that we all know and love is changing because an American corporation started making their own K-dramas, which are not authentically Korean. A stereotypical K-drama is usually a 16-episode TV show with one season that is broadcast on Korean TV once or twice a week. It is often a romantic love story that focuses on slowly building tension between the two protagonists, who share an innocent kiss around episode 10. The classic K-dramas are pretty conservative. But Netflix originals are different from the usual K-drama format. They have fewer episodes, sometimes have multiple seasons, often have open endings in the season finale, show more violence and have more explicit intimate scenes. Netflix, in this argument, is an outsider who is creating shows without understanding Korean culture or the storytelling language of K-dramas, making the genre worse. For full disclosure, I personally disagree with that statement, but I want to take these arguments seriously and try to understand what this discourse is about. Netflix is ruining K-dramas is an opinion a lot of viewers share, so there must be a valid concern, a pattern people have noticed that is worth analyzing. In this video, we are going to examine the arguments from the discourse and look at a lot of charts to see whether the data supports the claims. We are also going to explore how K-dramas are produced and financed, and how the industry changed in the last 20 years to illustrate that a lot of things that Netflix is accused of, everyone else does too. Before we dive into the topic, let me just say two things. First, this video is not sponsored by Netflix as part of their conspiracy to ruin K-dramas. And second, you are allowed to think that Netflix K-dramas are bad, and I'm not trying to take it away from you. Not every TV show is supposed to cater to your or my taste, and that is okay. Let's start by defining Netflix K-dramas, so we are on the same page regarding what exactly we are talking about, because very often in this discussion, people bring up K-dramas that were made by other channels. I would define Netflix original K-dramas as fictional South Korean shows that were financed by Netflix and exclusively released there and nowhere else. So, which K-dramas does this apply to? Here's the full list in chronological order at the time of writing in November 2023. My Only Love Song, Two Seasons of Kingdom, Persona, My First First Love, Two Seasons of Love Alarm, My Hollow Love, Extracurricular, The Schooner's Files, Sweet Home with Three Seasons, Move to Heaven, so Not Worth It, Two Seasons of DP, Squid Game, Hellbound, My Name, The Silent Sea, All of Us Are Dead, Juvenile Justice, Money Heist, The Sound of Magic, Remarriage and Desires, A Model Family, Narco Saints, Glitch, Somebody, The Fabulous, The Glory, Love to Hate You, Queen Maker, Black Knights, Bloodhounds, Celebrity, Mask Girl, A Time Called You, Song of the Bandits, Duna, Daily Dose of Sunshine, and Gyeongsong Creature. Netflix also releases a number of movies each year, but K-drama viewers tend to not watch Korean movies for some reason, so they are not included in this discussion. There are also shows that are technically Netflix K-dramas, since they paid a big part of the production costs, but are not considered Netflix originals, because they also aired on Korean TV. Mr. Sunshine, for example, had a budget of 43 billion won, out of which 30 billion was paid by Netflix. SBS turned down the K-drama, and it aired on TVN instead, but Netflix has the exclusive rights for international distribution. Does this make Mr. Sunshine a Netflix K-drama or a TVN K-drama? You can use either argument, depending on which side of the debate you are on. Some other notable Netflix collaborations with TVN and JTBC were 
crash landing on you, it's okay to not be okay, nevertheless, run on, Itaewon class, extraordinary attorney Uyang Woo, and some others. K-dramas are usually financed by several streaming services, channels, and sponsors, making the ownership attribution unclear. Netflix also invests in a lot of KBS, SBS, and NBC K-dramas in exchange for international and domestic distribution rights. But if we count just the K-dramas that are exclusively available on Netflix, then it's a total of 38. Is that a lot, actually? Is Netflix cornering the market on Korean dramas? Let's put this number into context. For this video, I compiled a dataset of all K-dramas that were released by the biggest channels and streaming services from 2019 to 2023. This is by no means the full list of all K-dramas that came out during that time, but I think it is enough to contextualize the data on Netflix by comparing it with the other channels. For this dataset, I manually went through the list of every K-drama that came out in the last five years on DramaWiki, picked the ones from the biggest channels, and then cross-referenced each show on my drama list several times. This leaves us with a little over 500 K-dramas. If you want to look at the dataset itself, you can find the download link for this spreadsheet in the description box. Feel free to play around with it, look for mistakes, or add more data points yourself. And yes, this was a ton of work, so you can show your appreciation by supporting me on Patreon. Let's take a look at our first chart. I arranged the data into three groups. The terrestrial Korean channels that are free, KBS, NBC, and SBS. The number of shows these channels release each year has been decreasing for reasons that are going to become clear later in the video. Then we have the second group. These are the paid television networks. TVN, JTBC, OCN, and ENA. This is where the most popular K-dramas air. In case it isn't super clear from that chart, OCN gradually disappeared and instead ENA emerged as a new player. The most prolific K-drama producer of the last five years has consistently been TVN. The third group are streaming services, which have been ramping up K-drama production. This is the number of K-dramas by Netflix, which is growing, but the company hasn't taken over the industry just yet. Considering how much we invest in Korea, I will not be surprised if they become the biggest K-drama producer in one or two years. But even if they do, there is a lot of competition. Even if you hate Netflix originals, I think there are more than enough shows for you to watch. Let's talk about how K-dramas get made. One misconception we need to clear up is that Netflix K-dramas are supposedly not Korean enough, since an American company is producing them. In 2016, when Netflix first came to Korea, there was briefly a content team based in LA, but the company quickly pivoted and established a local Korean office in Seoul, which started building relationships within the K-drama industry. It's not super clear whether the American team even produced any shows at all. In the writing stage of K-dramas, there is not that much difference between streaming and channel content, since neither comes up with a plot for K-dramas themselves. Independent production companies from Korea that have their own screenwriters pitch the scripts to different channels and streaming services, and whoever thinks it is a good investment greenlights and finances the show in exchange for distribution rights. Korean Netflix originals are written by the same screenwriters who make regular TV K-dramas, are produced by the same production companies with the same staff, star people from the exact same pool of actors and are filmed and edited in Korea. Kim Min Young, the vice president of content for Asia, is the woman responsible for choosing which K-dramas get picked up by Netflix, talking to the screenwriters in Netflix's office in Seoul. At what point of this production process exactly does the alleged dilution of Korean culture happen? We should also take a look at how the K-drama industry changed over time. 
In the 2000s, around 70-80% of the production cost for a K-drama was paid by the channel after the show was finished airing, and the rest had to come from investors and from selling the broadcast rights overseas. In the 2010s, after product placement in K-dramas became legal, around a third of the budget came from the channel, another third from advertisers, and a third through international distribution. With the integration of advertising, K-dramas got higher budgets, leading to better quality, in exchange for cringe product placement. To film a K-drama for a channel, the production company, if it doesn't have a big team, needs to rent a director and the equipment from the channel, which puts the majority of creative decisions in the network's hands. Keep in mind that channels have to adhere to Korean broadcasting regulations. Simultaneously, they have to make shows that are not controversial to be as advertiser-friendly as possible. Genres like thrillers and horror were not super popular with the channels because very few companies wanted their products to be associated with darker topics. The 2010s is also when a lot of privately owned paid channels emerged. This is when the fragmentation of the K-drama industry started. KBS, NBC and SBS no longer had a monopoly on K-drama production, and the new networks began making their own TV shows. To stand out among the competition, the paid channels started targeting more specific niches with darker and more explicit themes. People who accuse Netflix of ruining K-dramas like to pretend that the streaming service is the first one to start making violent or spicy Korean shows, which is simply not true. Did everyone forget OCN thrillers or classic Korean movies like Old Boy? Netflix did not invent on-screen violence. Remember that chart from earlier that shows the decrease in the number of K-dramas produced yearly by the free channels? There were several reasons for this development. By the late 2010s, the K-drama industry had a lot of channels that competed for viewers' attention, which led to a decline in ad revenue. Labor laws in Korea improved by the end of the decade, forcing the channels to pay the staff better and switch to more humane working hours. As K-drama production got more expensive and less profitable, channels had to decrease the number of shows they produced each year. That's when Netflix emerged as the savior of the K-drama industry. Netflix pays 110% of the budget up front, which is less of a financial risk for the production companies. Netflix K-dramas use almost no product placement and have way bigger budgets that allow even higher quality special effects. The streaming giant invests in genres that are deemed unprofitable by Korean TV stations and encourages screenwriters to try out new storytelling formats while providing a lot of creative freedom. For production companies in Korea, Netflix is the most desirable partner to work with. The streaming service also gladly collaborates with smaller independent studios and cares more about the quality and originality of the scripts. Meanwhile, channels still prefer to hire the big and established production companies to redo the conventional and risk-free K-dramas that can be filled with ads. Netflix and other streaming services are also not subject to Korean broadcasting regulations, so they can depict more sensitive topics without self-censoring. A show like DP, which critiques the Korean military, was only possible on a streaming service. Let me put on my tinfoil hat real quick. What if Netflix K-dramas are the real K-dramas, written the way the Korean screenwriters want to, and the network K-dramas are the censored and less creative ones? Netflix invests in training programs for the future generation of filmmakers, screenwriters and post-production staff, helping the young talent gain experience in the industry. The streaming platform is planning to use a first-time writer or director to make one in every five of its upcoming Korean titles. So, no, Netflix is not ruining K-dramas. They are keeping the industry afloat. Without their investment, there would be way fewer K-dramas, and the ones that get made would have lower budgets. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, though. Netflix's involvement in Korea also has some downsides that we need to view critically. 
of all the criticisms Netflix gets for K-dramas, the most important ones are the company's approach to intellectual property rights and wages. Netflix owns all of the IP rights to the K-dramas they produce. If a show becomes super popular, like Squid Game did, Netflix is the only one profiting from the success. Hwang Dong-hyuk, the creator of the hit show, is not making any money from all this Squid Game merch. And neither do the supporting actors, who are severely underpaid and don't get any residuals. While performers who play the main characters get paid better on Netflix shows, supporting actors get paid significantly less than on regular network K-dramas. Since they are paid per episode and Netflix shows have fewer episodes that take longer to shoot, this isn't a good deal for the actors. Oh, and allegedly, the contracts are in English and not in Korean, which seems super sketchy. Netflix refuses to meet the Korean Actors Union and points out that they comply with local labor laws. They shift the blame to the production companies, who are responsible for hiring and paying the talent. Guys, guys, no need to argue about who is treating their workers worse. Both production companies and Netflix could easily afford to pay fair wages. One of the accusations against Netflix is that their K-dramas are pandering to international viewers and ignoring domestic audiences. Here's what Kim Min Young, the Netflix vice president of content for Asia, has to say about it. When we're making shows in Korea, we're going to make sure it's for Koreans. We are not trying to make everything global. Hmm, I'm not sure whether I'm fully buying this argument. Because the math is not mathing. Internationally, Netflix currently has around 247 million subscribers. Netflix CEO Ted Sarandos said himself that 60% of their subscribers watch Korean content, which is a little under 150 million people worldwide. Netflix has around 5 million subscribers in Korea. Even if every single person in South Korea had a Netflix account, the majority of K-drama viewers would still be international. It is profitable for Netflix to invest in this country, because audiences all over the world are watching. A high-budget K-drama is still cheap in comparison to the average cost of producing a show in Hollywood. Compare season 1 of Stranger Things, which cost 6 million USD per episode, to Squid Game, which only cost 2.4 million USD per episode an incredibly high budget for the K-drama industry. But Netflix is not the first foreign investor who figured out that K-dramas are profitable. In the 2000s, Japan was the main export market. A lot of casting choices directly targeted Japanese viewers. For example, casting K-pop idols or specific actors who are especially popular in Japan. Another tactic was making sure the name of the K-drama and the main character are easy to pronounce for Japanese speakers. Adapting popular Japanese books or manga as K-dramas is also a sure way to guarantee views. Remember Boys Over Flowers, the quintessential late 2000s Korean drama? It was based on the Japanese manga Hana Yori Dango. In 2012, the Korean president visited an island that is at the center of a territorial dispute between Japan and Korea, which soured the relationship between the two countries, leading to the loss of Japan as the main K-drama export market. Luckily, Chinese companies started investing heavily in K-dramas in the 2010s, which brought a major change to the production process. Up until this point, K-dramas were filmed every week while the show was airing, which allowed last-minute changes to the plot to cater to audiences' reactions. Filming and editing the whole show and then airing it made it easier to work along the strict Chinese censorship rules. Pre-produced TV shows became the standard in the industry because of foreign intervention. A lot of K-drama elements from the 2000s and 2010s that we now consider typical K-drama tropes exist because these shows were meant to be sold to other countries and not because they are authentically Korean. 
are we really making advertisers and Chinese and Japanese investors the gatekeepers of Korean culture? In 2016, the United States and Korea deployed an anti-missile defense system, which China saw as a threat. In response, China imposed sanctions, banning Korean content. Just in time for Netflix, an American company, to start aggressively investing in South Korea. K-drama screenwriters now tailor their content to a global audience. For example, Money Heist is an adaptation of a successful Spanish Netflix original, Casa del Papel. After all, Korean adaptations of popular media worked for the Japanese market before. Song of the Bandits, a mix between a historical K-drama and a Western, might appeal to American viewers. Another time a Netflix K-drama catered to an international audience was with the sitcom So Not Worth It, which centers around a group of university students with a diverse international cast. This show has a very distracting laugh track in the background, something K-dramas don't do. South Korea has a population of 51 million people, making it a relatively small market that cannot produce over 100 high-budget K-dramas a year just for domestic viewers. The K-drama industry has relied on foreign investors for the last 20 years, and it started pandering to international viewers way before Netflix entered the market. A very common complaint is that Netflix is making shorter K-dramas, usually with only 6 to 10 episodes per season, which is significantly less than the classic 16-episode format. If you look at the average amount of episodes per season per channel, we will see that Netflix shows are pretty short, with an average length of 8.34 episodes per K-drama, similar to the other streaming platforms. KBS and NBC are outliers in this chart because these are the channels that release several shows with over 100 episodes each year. The reason why streaming platforms and channels have different season lengths is because of the way the success of a K-drama is measured. Channels care about ratings. How many people tuned in during every episode of a show? Ratings dropped significantly in the last 30 years because there is more competition now. Back in the 90s, a popular drama could achieve ratings of 50 or 60%, a number that is impossible today. If a lot of people tune into a K-drama on TV, that means the advertising slots are worth more. But Netflix cares about a different metric. They allegedly measure how many viewers finished the whole season of a show. A metric Netflix doesn't release, by the way. And even if they did, it would be useless to compare it to TV ratings in Korea. But I still want to figure out whether K-dramas with 16 episodes are more popular with the viewers. So the data I can compare across all channels and streaming services are my drama list ratings. MDL is an English language website where users from all over the world can track which K-dramas they watch, write reviews and leave ratings on a scale from 0 to 10. A metric that is flawed because it fluctuates constantly, but it is available for every K-drama. Let's look at the data. The x-axis in this scatter plot represents the number of episodes per season, and the y-axis represents the MDL ratings. Most ratings fall somewhere between 6 and 9. The way I see it, there are three groups of K-dramas in this chart. The ones with over 100 episodes tend to have quite low ratings. Then we have another group over here between 25 and 55 episodes per season. These shows have slightly higher ratings on average, but this format seems not that popular either. And these are the shows with 21 or fewer episodes, which is the vast majority of K-dramas. Let's zoom in for more detail. Computer, enhance. Yeah, that's better. If you can't see a clear trend on this chart, that's because there is none. The 16-episode format, which is the most common one, doesn't stand out as having better ratings. The difference between the formats is not that big, but if we really have to pick a winner, 
the highest rated format is 20 episodes, followed by the 10 episode K-dramas. The sweet spot seems to be anywhere between 6 and 21 episodes, which is the length of most K-dramas. The 16 episode format is not superior, it is just more common. Proponents of K-dramas with 16 episodes argue that a good story needs time to breathe and move at a slow pace. Viewers invest time and emotions into K-dramas and want to see fleshed out character arcs instead of rushed narratives. While this is a very strong argument, I don't think all K-dramas have to be exactly 16 episodes. TV shows are good because they tell a story in an engaging way and every story needs a different amount of time to be told. A lot of K-dramas would be perfect if they were a couple of episodes shorter. Let's be honest, very few K-dramas have enough plot to fill out 16 episodes. So many shows have useless filler scenes, flashbacks or unnecessary breakups just because there are 4 more episodes left in the show and something needs to happen. TV channels make 16 episode K-dramas with a set episode length because this format is structured to best suit advertising time slots, regardless of whether it serves the plot. Netflix, on the other hand, doesn't have strict rules about episode length and amount, which is arguably better for storytelling. One of the main appeals of K-dramas is how conservative their depiction of intimacy is. Korean TV shows focus on emotions and character development, which seems like a breath of fresh air, compared to American TV shows, which have a lot of unnecessary nudity, often in the first five minutes of a show, for no other reason than shock value. Netflix and other streaming services have produced several spicy K-dramas, which a lot of viewers are upset about. Squid Game, Mask Girl, The Glory, Somebody, My Name and Money Heist are some of the Netflix originals with spicy scenes. If you would rather watch a slow burn romance, it is understandable, but if this is your type of plot, maybe don't watch a violent thriller. The cute romance Netflix originals are pretty tame, just like the regular network rom-coms. People will complain about a show that implies two characters spending the night together but have no problem with the amount of extreme violence in Korean shows. Why are two consenting adults being intimate with each other so horrible? But brutal murders, disturbing bullying scenes and extremely graphic violence are okay. Showing the topless male lead in a shower scene is super common and uncontroversial by the way. Viewers don't complain about the fan service. I guess as long as women are covered up, there is no problem. If you are looking for recommendations for a K-drama without any spicy scenes, then you can watch pretty much any K-drama. Your chances of accidentally stumbling upon anything more explicit than a kiss in a Korean TV show are super low. A thing that Netflix started doing that a lot of viewers absolutely despise is splitting the season into two parts. Instead of releasing the whole show at once or releasing an episode or two a week, like channels do. Splitting seasons seems pretty universally hated. I have not heard of anyone liking this trend, and yet Netflix keeps doing it over and over again. Except this has only happened three times so far. The Glory, Money Heist, and My First First Love are the only Netflix K-dramas that have been released in two parts. Out of 38 Netflix K-dramas, three is not that many, but still three too many if you hate the concept. Technically, Gyeong Song Creature is also going to be split into two parts, with the first seven episodes airing end of December and the last three episodes airing two weeks later. But I don't think it should count as a split season, because a lot of regular TV K-dramas have two-week breaks between the episodes, and nobody would seriously argue that they count as split seasons. And I'm not pointing the finger at any particular K-dramas here. 
a lot of viewers wait until all episodes of a show that airs every week are out, so they can binge the whole show at once. How's that different from waiting until both parts of a Netflix original are released? So, how does Netflix compare to the other channels and streaming services? In the last 5 years, out of over 500k dramas, it has only happened 15 times, or 14 if we don't count Kyung Song Creature. I think this is another case of a trend that everyone is guilty of that is pinned on Netflix. In a similar vein, Netflix K-dramas often have multiple seasons. K-drama fans are used to self-contained TV shows with only one season that wraps up the story in a nice bow. And if we look at the data, then, huh, TVN is the channel that makes multiple seasons most often? Well, I'm sure we can figure out a way to blame it on Netflix. There is a fascinating aspect of the Netflix is ruining K-dramas discourse that I want to bring up. In discussions about how modern cinema sucks compared to the good old Hollywood masterpieces, the critique is that contemporary movies are too formulaic. Every American movie is just a franchise or a remake these days. Nobody is making anything original or interesting anymore. But in the K-drama community, it is the other way around. Netflix K-dramas are accused of being too edgy and too experimental. They don't use enough cliches and don't stick to the old formula. A lot of Netflix originals invent new genres that haven't existed before and break the conventional storytelling structures. A lot of K-drama viewers specifically don't want subversive plots, they want a comforting show full of tropes with a predictable plot. The same old rich CEO dating a poor girl story that we have seen countless times before. If you are one of the people who likes complaining about the death of cinema, maybe you should switch to K-dramas. There are a lot of really cool Korean shows that are similar to classic Asian movies. The statement that Netflix is ruining K-dramas implies that they are bad, while regular network K-dramas are good. Is that true? Surely this would be reflected in their ratings. According to the data, TVN makes the most popular K-dramas, followed by Netflix. Turns out, KBS is the one ruining K-dramas which was one of the two original channels that started making Korean dramas in the early 90s in the first place. By the way, if you for some reason think this video doesn't spend enough time showing charts, you will find an interactive version of every chart linked in the description. The lowest rated K-drama of the last 5 years, with a rating of just 6.1, is the second season of Love Alarm a show that is often described as the worst K-drama ever. I guess Netflix is ruining K-dramas. The highest rated show on the website with a rating of 9.2 is Move to Heaven, also a Netflix production, which means that Netflix K-dramas are superior? Or maybe the existence of Love Alarm doesn't ruin K-dramas, just like the existence of Move to Heaven doesn't mean that Netflix originals are flawless. Maybe this is not a zero-sum game. Which K-dramas exactly are ruining the genre is also different depending on who you ask. A lot of people bring up Squid Game, the most successful show ever, as an example of a bad K-drama. Was it really such a bad show? Because I recall everyone being very emotionally invested in the Marble episode. A lot of people who never watched K-dramas before started watching them after Squid Game. Oh, is that what this really is about? Remember 10 years ago, when you were the only nerd at school who was into K-dramas? They were not considered cool. It was a niche club for weirdos. And now? People who made fun of K-dramas and K-pop are suddenly into it too? You watched K-dramas before everybody else did. Real fans are not like those newbies whose first Korean show was Squid Game. They don't understand K-dramas like you do. 
they are inferior to the people who started with crash landing on you, who in turn are not as cool as the ones who got into K-dramas in 2016 when Descendants of the Sun came out. Or maybe you're one of the OGs who watched Boys Over Flowers in 2009, who are not that hardcore compared to the real K-drama connoisseurs who watched Winter Sonata in 2002. I guarantee you that in 10 years, we will be looking back at the early 2020s as the golden age of K-dramas, back when they were still good, not like any of those new shows released in 2030. Who knows, maybe there will even be a new player in the K-drama industry who is going to be the next scapegoat accused of ruining the industry. K-dramas are evolving, and we need to accept that this genre is not going to stay the same forever. Maybe not all change is bad. K-dramas now have way higher budgets than they used to. The production value went from cheap soap opera quality to high-end cinematic masterpiece levels. The wages for people making K-dramas increased too, and your favorite actors are now recognized internationally. The variety of different genres to choose from is bigger than ever before. I'm going to leave you with one last fact from the dataset. K-dramas are getting better if we look at the average ratings for each year, so maybe not everything is ruined. If you miss the good old days of K-dramas, nobody can stop you from rewatching any of the old classics. No matter how many new shows streaming services will release, your favorite comfort K-drama will always be there for you. It is probably even available on Netflix.